with our scripture reading, we have, we have jumped back in time, uh, almost a thousand years or so from, from where we've been these past, past few months with, with Easter and then, and then Pentecost and then looking a little bit uh, last week at the beginnings of the church. And over the next three Sundays, I'm going to be away on vacation, and so we've got some great guest preachers lined up. Sean Carew will be here next Sunday. Sean is, is the director of the Providence Rescue Mission, which, which ministers to the, the homeless population um, in Providence. And then the following Sunday, uh, Reverend John Sweet will be here. John is uh, he's a parish associate at Providence Presbyterian, and he's a, he's a chaplain at the Eleanor Slater Psychiatric Hospital. And then the week after that, uh, Reverend Karina Hoyt, who is the state director of Rhode Island Young Life, which is a ministry to high school students. She's going to be here. And so coming up, we have, we have a great opportunity to hear from these three different people uh, who minister to and with and among um, very particular populations. And today, we have entered a season in the church, coming out of the seasons of Lent and Easter and then Pentecost and then Trinity Sunday last week, we have now entered a season in the church called Ordinary Time. You'll notice that uh, the green will be the color on the table and on the pulpit here for the next several months. The, the reds and the whites and the purples of, of those, those particular days of, of uh, celebration and feasts and fasts, whether physical or spiritual, they are put away for a while. We are in a time in the church calendar, uh, a time we might say that is marked out for listening and responding to how God is at work in the ordinary of day-to-day -day life. One of the ways we'll be doing this later in the summer is with a series on Sabbath. But for now, we've got several guest preachers coming up at the beginning next week, and so, so for this Sunday, I did what I often do when we've got a week that's just kind of a, an in-between week. I looked to the lectionary to see what the suggested scripture passages were for this particular Sunday. And there was a great gospel passage from Luke 8 about, about Jesus healing and, and exercising uh, a man. Jesus coming alongside uh, someone who was an outcast in his own community, and healing him and restoring him. And then there was this fantastic New Testament passage from, from Paul's letter to, to the Galatians with that amazing affirmation that in Christ there is therefore no longer Jew or Greek, slave or free, male and female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. Right? Not that all distinctions are erased, but that even within, because of those distinctions, we are all one in Jesus. And then there was an old, this Old Testament reading suggested for today, this passage from 1 Kings. And I'll be honest, I, I love this passage. And so after a quick read-through, one of my first thoughts was, was just a quick, well, this will be good, because there's this great part about Elijah somehow encountering God in the, quote, sound of sheer silence. And I thought, yay, that will be a nice little teaser for a series on Sabbath coming up later in the summer. And so, confession time. That was it. I read through it. I said, great. I already know how this will go. I know where the sermon's going to end up. This is going to be a good, easy week. No problem. Nice and easy. We're going to do this passage. And then I spent some time with it. Maybe more importantly, I let this passage of Scripture spend some time with me. And I realized, uh-oh, I mean, going into it, I knew the story here that, that leads up to Elijah, Elijah's predicament, so I was pretty sure I knew how everything would play out, but, well, as it turns out, ironically enough, given what Elijah goes through, what I thought was not how it ended up. Because what's going on here with Elijah? Goodness, the, the highs and the lows, the intensity and the resentment, this passage is filled with passion and pathos and, and deep abiding questions. Because this here, this is a wild, untamed passage about a wild, untamed prophet encountering a wild, untamed God in a new and 
life-changing and surprising way. Now, the reasons why Elijah ends up here in the wilderness and then on that mountain, you can, uh, this afternoon, you can go back and read chapter 18 of 1 Kings. You can read all about it. It's fascinating and powerful, and, and it itself raises all sorts of wonderfully challenging questions for this morning. I don't want us to get lost in all of that, so, so for this morning, we just need to know that Elijah, the prophet of God, he had been full of energy and enthusiasm and boldness for God. He was, he was on fire for God, almost literally. If you go back and read chapter 18, he was, he was definitely fire adjacent for God, right? He had, and he had zealously done what he thought he was supposed to be doing. For all we know, he had done exactly what God had called him to do and maybe even gone above and beyond for good measure. At the very least, Elijah had done what he sincerely thought God was calling him to do, God wanted him to do. The result was not at all what he expected. He had stood fast and proclaimed that the Lord was the only true God. He had stood up for the truth in the face of a society that had given in to idol worship, a false god being Baal. And he had even publicly and loudly and pointedly, he had won the argument in spectacular fashion about who was the true God. But rather than then being able to rest in his success. Well, that's where our passage this morning picks up. The result of his zealous faith and dedication, the result was that he was now a marked man with a price on his head. He had to flee for his life into the wilderness. He's even in the process here. He dismisses his servant. This means he is not just downsizing. He is liquidating his assets. He is getting out of ministry altogether. He's had it. He is done. So there in the wilderness, he sits down under a tree and says, I'm done. Go ahead, kill me now, Lord. So here is Elijah, prophet of God, who has just seen profound miracles. And now here he is, alone in the wilderness. He is spent, he is exhausted, and nothing has turned out like he thought it would. He thought it should. So much so that he asked the Lord to just take his life. And he lays down and falls asleep. So there he is sleeping. And then suddenly, the Lord sends an angel who wakes him. And, and what does the angel say when he, when he wakes Elijah up? What does he say? Fear not, Elijah! Nope. Elijah, I bring you good tidings from the Lord. Nope. Elijah, repent! Elijah, here's a Bible study and a theology lesson to help you figure out where it all went wrong. Nope. And nope. None of that. The angel doesn't even say, Elijah, do you want to talk about it? No, right there. First and foremost, what does the angel of the Lord do? The angel, right there in the midst of all of this, in the midst of Elijah's despair and exhaustion and, and no doubt his doubts and his questions and, and all of that, the angel wakes him, cooks him a meal. Elijah, get up and eat. There's food and a jar of water there for him. And that's it. In the midst of all that Elijah is going through, what does the angel do? He brings him a casserole. He just says, here... Eat. Eat. So Elijah eats and drinks and then goes back to sleep. Has that ever been you? For whatever reason. Maybe grief. Maybe despair. Maybe deep disappointment. Doubts and questions. Maybe just sheer exhaustion from whatever life has been throwing at you just so that just getting up and finding the strength to eat is all you can muster. Has that ever been you? So can we just acknowledge, because here it is with Elijah and the angel of the Lord, that yes, sometimes that's all we can manage, but also that yes, sometimes 
that's enough. And maybe there are times when that's all that's asked of us for the moment. And that even that is God's good provision and grace for you. So Elijah manages to eat, and he goes back to sleep. And then a bit later, the angel comes a second time and says, and says get up and eat. And this time adds, otherwise, the journey will be too much for you. There's yet a purpose for you, Elijah. So Elijah eats and travels on to Mount Horeb, the mountain of God, also known by the name Mount Sinai, that place where God had shown up for Moses and the Israelites in their time of need all those years ago in thunder and lightning and power. And so you can imagine what Elijah might be expecting. But this time, well, he's there in a cave on that mountain. And the word of the Lord comes to him and says, what are you doing here, Elijah? Now, this question is not for God's benefit, right? It's not like the Lord is, is trying to have a nice, quiet vacation in the mountains and suddenly stumbles upon Elijah and then with shock and annoyance says, Elijah, what are you doing here? No, right? This is not a question for God's benefit. This is a question for Elijah's benefit. So Elijah answers, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the Israelites, they have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, killed your prophets. And I alone am left, and they are seeking after my life to take it away. These, by the way, these are Elijah's talking points. And they're good talking points. The word of the Lord just says, says, okay, but now go. Go out. Stand on the mountain. The Lord will pass by. Talking points are not Elijah. You're going to see the Lord. So he does. And suddenly, there on the mountain, there's a howling wind so strong, it is tearing everything down, and even the rocks are shattering. But the Lord is not in the wind. And then there's an earthquake. The very foundations of the earth are shaking under his feet, but the Lord's not there either. And then a fire, a mountain engulfed in flame, but the Lord's not in the fire either. But after the, after the fire, The NRSV translation, the one we read that's in our pews, is the sound of sheer silence. And he hears the silence, and he hears the silent sound. He wraps his cloak around his face. He goes and stands at the entrance to the cave because he knows. It's not how he expected, but God has shown up. Lord again says, what are you doing here, Elijah? And again, Elijah gives the same talking points, but now the Lord says, okay, fine, but go and return. Go, anoint these people, carry on the ministry. And by the way, you're not alone. There's 7,000 in Israel who have not bowed to Baal as well. And suddenly now, enough. Elijah goes. There are so many things here, aren't there? That's why I love this passage. I love that phrase, the sound of sheer silence. This can also be translated the voice of silence. Or the silent voice. It's the same word for voice that's used in the very next verse when it says, Then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? And you may have heard a phrase here and there, the still small voice. This is where it comes from. Elijah, go out because you're going to encounter the Lord. But the Lord wasn't in the great wind or in the earthquake or in the fire. And after the fire, a silent voice. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle because he knew. It struck me, especially because at the beginning of this, Elijah is done. 
He is, he is spent and he is convinced that he alone, it is he alone that is left. He, so he is done. He is walking away from it all. But then at the end here, he finds out that there are those that he is to anoint to carry on the ministry. And even beyond that, there are thousands of others. Elijah, Elijah was convinced the Lord was not working in or through anyone else. It was just him. And this, this was the end of it all ends up finding out that that is so far from the truth. And the turning point for Elijah is not in the big, zealous public display and winning argument that got him into all of this in the first place. And it's not the strong, loud, and frenzied activity of earth, wind, and fire. The turning point for Elijah is when he hears that silent voice. And there are certainly applications there. For us about our direct our relationship with with God and how we listen in that direct way and finding those those times of quiet in fact that was that was actually what I first thought the first thought I had about this and the connection between this and later in the summer with the series on the Sabbath see 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 Elijah's story says be sure to have your quiet time yes all of that is true let me also suggest something else this morning. Elijah was convinced that he was it. And it wore him down. He was spent and he was done. But then he finds out that God has been at work in and through all these other people, thousands of them, that, that, that it seems he, he otherwise never would have thought to consider. But that only... After he hears that silent voice, and I can't help but wonder, where, where are the silent voices now, here, in our time, in our place? Where are those voices that we just don't hear because there's so much other stuff it's much easier to pay attention to, much easier to listen to. Whose voices do we silence? Just by ignoring them or pushing them aside because it'd be too awkward and uncomfortable for us to do otherwise. Or even those voices that we that we sort of listen to, but, but really we only listen so we know when, when there'll be a space for our turn to speak again. In these next three weeks, just as it happens, we are going to be hearing from three different people who do ministry with, with people and, and among people who are often some of the silent voices in our society, in our communities. The homeless and those stuck in poverty and in cycles of poverty. Those with mental health issues. And teenagers. Karina will tell you, so many of the teenagers she works with, they are carrying around burdens that we don't even know about, even though they're often burdens that we give to them. Heavy stuff. And yet each of these people, Sean, John, and, and Karina, they will tell you that it is in the lives of those people that they see God, that they meet God at work in powerful and unique ways. Jesus said, whatever you do to the least of these, you do unto me. The least of these are any of the folks that we tend to push off to the margins and therefore that we tend to just not hear. The least of these tend to be the, the people, the silent voices, the voices that are all too easy for us not to hear. But Jesus said, something about meeting their needs. And you can only meet someone's needs if you know what they are, what those needs are, and you can only know what those needs are if you can truly hear them and listen to them. And Jesus said there's something about doing that that puts you in relationship with Jesus, that allows you to see Jesus in a powerful and unique way. What are the voices, the silent voices around us? In our communities, whose voices do we not so easily let ourselves hear? 
Do we hear? Do we hear the voices of those who come back from serving our country, fighting our wars, only to come back and struggle and suffer physically, emotionally, and financially, right? We don't have a good history of that, do we? For those of us who are white, living in a predominantly white society and all the weight of our history, do we really hear our brothers and sisters who are people of color when they tell us what it is truly like to live as a person of color in our society? Or when we engage in conversations and debates about security, do we do so? Especially we who are Christians, do we to whom Jesus says, I was hungry, I was thirsty, I was naked, I was a stranger, and whatever you did to the least of these, you did to me? Have we truly heard the voices of those who find themselves caught in a system that asks them to risk injury or cycles of poverty in one country or imprisonment and separation and scapegoating in another? Or do we hear the voices shown? John and Karina here, those caught in those cycles of poverty, those with mental health issues, our youth who carry so many burdens that we have given to them, or do we find that it's easier not to listen, but then wonder why God might seem distant? Any other countless examples I'm sure we could come up with. I read of Elijah and that silent voice that he heard that made all the difference. And I cannot help but wonder where are those silent voices around us that when we finally hear them, we are invited then into a deep and particular and unique encounter with God and with those, those whom God is at work in and through and perhaps in perhaps hard and messy ways also in deep and profound ways. Elijah heard that silent voice. It was then that he was able to get up and go and return to encounter those through whom God would be at work. It was then that he finally found himself renewed. I hear of Elijah and the silent voice that he finally heard. And I wonder, wonder. Maybe in those times when our faith is struggling and we're not too sure that God is at work around us anymore, at least not in any sort of way that seems good to us, that maybe the answer, at least in part, is to pay attention to where the silent voices are and go there and listen. Maybe it is there that we will see the Lord pass by. We too will have the strength to get up and go. Because the promise, the promise of God to Elijah there on the mountain, and the promise of God to you in Jesus Christ is that he is always, always at work. And his grace for you is like a meal and a nap when you are at your most exhausted. His grace for you it is enough. But sometimes we just have to know where to listen. So may we be a people who listen for the voice of silence and for the voice of the silence. We might just find Jesus there, passing by, and he might just invite us to get up and come along. Know that he is yet at work and know that his grace is enough. Let's pray. Lord, give us not just eyes to see, but give us ears to hear. To hear your voice amidst all the sounds and voices that surround us, to hear your voice. Lord, give us the grace to hear the voice of those we often overlook. And in those silent voices, 
Lord, you have promised that we will get a glimpse of you, and of your grace, and of your mercy, and of your love, and it will be enough. Lord, may it be so. In Christ's name.